you so much for inviting us to Bergen Exchanges in 2022. And um, I really, truly appreciate the, uh, the welcome spirit here on the, this, um, the Law Transform team. So um, the project we represent today uh, by our Romanian wing, so to speak, is CONSENT and stands for Cosmopolitan Turn and Democratic Sentiments. Uh, at its core, we seek to investigate to what extent, if any, the formal demands raised by children's rights has had a transformative effect on population, professional practices, and throughout politics, policies, and legal designs across Norway and in Romania. We use child protection services as a case to study how two widely different European nation states address the fact that children carry the same rights. So today we will hear, hear about cosmopolitanism, uh, challenges to the child protection system in Romania predominantly, and the famous worldwide case of uh, Barne Varne, the, the Neustal case, which uh, um, uh, through the concept of Barne Varne as an intrusive state, uh, as a concept globally. So we're going to talk about that because that was a Romanian family. Uh, my name is Oscar Falk Eriksson. I come from Oslo Metropolitan University and uh, I am on the project, but I'm on the Norwegian wing. So here are my Romanian colleagues and uh, we're going to kick this off with Aaron and uh, we take it from there. Thank you. Do I speak uh, to the mic? Oh, thank you, Asger. Uh So nice to be here in Bergen. Thanks for the invite. Uh, and also glad to work together on this with Oslo Met and the Bergen University. Uh, my name is Aaron Telek Dicetri. I represent a uh, mini team of the Romanian team together with my wife and colleague Viorela Telek Dicetri. Uh, important to introduce uh, my presentation with the idea that uh, we are also working in uh, transnationalism and actually the consent project already had an offspring entitled Castle. You can uh, check it on the website, which deals specifically with transnationalism, children left behind in Moldova and the Ukraine. Uh, and what I try to do in today's presentation is to connect uh, cosmopolitanism with the transnational age, uh, drawing on the experience of transnational families and their left behind children, which is a huge phenomenon in Eastern Europe, as you might know. Uh, the presentation is entitled uh, Children in an Age of Transnationalism, uh, the Cosmopolitanism of Care. Care has been a very central concept to the study of uh, transnational families. First, let's ask why do we talk about cosmopolitan children's rights rather than just children's rights? Uh, while originally universal human and later children's rights followed the quasi-cosmopolitan aim, with the cosmopolitan turn of the 90s and 2000s, this has become more differentiated, and specifically through the effective cosmopolitization of societies in the context of radical globalization and population movement. In this context, cosmopolitanism has been proposed both as a response to the inequalities inherent in globalization and to the hegemonic use of norms, including those of human rights therein. Therefore, cosmopolitanism should not be seen either as tantamount or as contrary to, but as complementary with human and respectively children's rights. Importantly though, it, uh, cosmopolitanism maintains its essentially normative character insofar it remains intimately connected to the idea of right. Its first version, Kantian political cosmopolitanism, is the most notorious. Uh, we mention it in our uh, project and studies. Uh, and it draws on Kant's political pro uh, proposal in towards perpetual peace uh, to establish a self standing domain of right beside domestic and international right, namely cosmopolitan right, to regulate state individual relationships and specifically being reduced to the right to visit. To be noted, this not, does not include the direct uh, natural normativity of human rights any more than the other two, namely domestic and international right. Uh, namely, it does not stipulate a political relationship of individuals beyond states. 
indeed Kant warns against such an entity, uh, a potential world state that would necessarily, in his opinion, turn into a global tyranny. On the other hand, non-regulated relationships between individuals are also morally wrong for Kant, since they are contrary to the interests of reason. The second version of cosmopolitanism that can be very well employed in social science is that of Ulrich Beck, uh, starting with 1998, summed up um, in the well contoured, so the, the well -con already well contoured cosmopolitan project has been summed up by him into a more concise slogan for social science methodological cosmopolitanism. In short, continuing the social scientific tradition of inequality research, he asked for the unit of analysis to be put in a global instead of a national context of inequalities. In short, this would mean that any individual or collectivity should be seen on the horizon of global, not merely national society. Note that this would only continue the spirit of Kantianism insofar as the structural aspects of embedding would also be considered along with the named unit of analysis. And now to transnationalism, the other pole of the argument. As mentioned, the cosmopolitan trend has emerged after the end of the Cold War, along with a gradual but massive increase in migration flows into what we may call the transnational age. Namely, beside a relative stasis to mo movement, a turn occurred from previously localized individuals, families, communities to a simultaneous existence in more than one place, society, state, or political community. The massive development of communication technologies also allowed the virtual unification of these physically disparate existences. Reading in retrospect, the very essence of cosmopolitanism can be linked to this transnational setup. Kant himself reduces cosmopolitan right to the right to visit, which is a transnational situation. And for example, uh, cosmopolitanism is identified with hospitality in Derrida. Now to transnational families, along with transnationalism, the focus in social research has also received an impetus towards relationality and therein towards the family, uh, as argued by Greshke and Ott, 2020. Uh, the family being seen as a space uh, previously pertaining to the domain of the private and now receiving interest as a publicly, societally relevant phenomenon. Thus, the concept of the transnational family has been coined by Brasherson and uh, Vorella in 2002 as an entity transcending the nation state logic of top down hierarchy and economy and territoriality. Instead, transnational families are seen by transnational family studies uh, to exist as a prototypal community functioning across such territories in a state of maintained migration. So not emigration or immigration, but a state of transmigration. Very emphatically, transnational families maintain their inner cohesion as families, their aspect of belonging, co-belonging, while also being actively involved in uh, and being parts of their respective societies, which is the aspect of participation. Now the core of the argument found also in Grashka and Ott, a very interesting idea. Uh, the two authors, while aiming to address a new sense of community in the global age, propose to view the transnational family as an archetype of global society. Drawing on Tönnies's uh, concepts of community and society, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, they aim to show that transnational families incorporate both of these concepts of, on a global plane, namely through belonging and particip participation. Besides escaping the political logic of individual, community, society, nation and state, this perspective brings the advantage of quite literally furnishing the cosmopolitan unit of analysis envisaged by Beck. By their very transnational limits in functioning, communicating, performing and acting, transnational families incorporate the global context of analysis needed for overcoming a nationalistic perspective. Translating this to our um, 
studies uh, I am making, and this will be the last slide or last uh, part of the argument. I'm proposing uh, an idea for childhood research um, based on the fact that the migrant segment of global society also always impacts its non-migrant segment through contacts, uh, population flows, diversity, remittances, economic and cultural transfer, etc. Uh, indeed, child-related issues themselves are brought into relief when put in a transnational perspective, as in many cases similar to the Nausdal case, which was a transnational phenomenon. Uh, and re revealing of the intrinsic flaws of the respective societal and institutional attitudes. In this context, I suggest to view Greshka and Ott's idea of transnational families' global participation as paradigmatic to understanding contemporary childhoods as such. Namely, instead of a national integration and inequality perspective, the social embedding of children should be considered the present and perspective manner of participation in global society. To put it, put it in Beck's terms, the unit of analysis, the child, should be seen as if belonging to a transnational family, as if empirically living beyond the borders of a single state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, we'll jump straight into, because of the time schedule there, we we'll jump straight to the next presentation and we start with Maria. Do you have your own microphone in next to you? Thank you very much for inviting us here and allowing us to reflect more on uh, the child protection issues of Romania. Yes, we are all from Romania. The title of my presentation would be Child Protection System Practice an inquiry into the decision-making processes in Romania. So um, reflecting on this, we have to look a little bit at where we started from and where we are now, or on the opposite, where we are now, and thinking a little bit on where we started from. So I was chosen to be part of this project, I think, because I'm one of those who worked in the child protection system before 1990, I was working in special schools and in an orphanage for very small children below three years of age who were in pretty, uh, these institutions were in pretty bad conditions and probably you still remember some of the images of the Romanian uh, child protection systems, I'm not sure, but you might remember some of you. So uh, in the first 15 years after the political shift, uh, Romania was trying to change the uh, laws, the child protection laws, uh, after in adopting the CRC in 1990. So it uh, took uh, 15 years until 2004, when Romania had the first democratic uh, children's rights based law. Uh, the Romanian law uh, is, uh, as I said, oriented towards children's rights, uh, oriented towards preserving the family, taking children out of the child protection system of institutions, uh, responding to children whose rights are violated, responding to abuse, uh, the institutionalization of children, uh, decentralization of uh, the child protection system, transform it in a more project-based system. Since 2004, uh, Romanian child protection banned um, spanking children in the families, the battering of children, introduced um, social ins inspection in institutions and in uh, uh, services, developed standards for public and non-profit services, reshaped residential care, uh, started uh, to send children in family foster care and um, first banned adoption, international adoptions, and, and then in the last years tried to simplify procedures of adoption. Um, it's interesting to look a little bit about uh, on how Romania's child protection system was evaluated in the light of the um, adopted international 
indicators. Uh, so the uh, UN Indicators Children's Rights Index appreciated the changes in Romania and considered uh, that um, uh, till, in, for example, in 2016, Romania was still well appreciated, having ranked uh, 16th or 15th, I think, in the uh, children's rights rankings worldwide. And it was uh, the highest ranking in the East European countries. Uh, after that, in, 2000, uh, in 2018, Romania dropped very much in this ranking. So it reached 113, it was ranked 113 uh, suddenly, which so this two years dropping in the ranking means that something doesn't go well in the child protection system in spite of the um, changes in the law. So to look a little bit in the, on the way, to reflect a little bit on the way that Romania um, works with child protection, uh, we have to analyze what's happened, what really happens, what happens with the laws, are they applied, are they not applied, uh, what is wrong with, with them? Until uh, 2013, they were perfect. So, um, what in our project, in the project that Aaron was talking about, made interviews with lots of um, professionals, and most of us explained us that there is a big gap between laws and practice. So uh, the laws are there, but the practice is far away from uh, what the law uh, expects from professionals. So um, um, one issue is um, that why don't professionals respect the laws? Uh, one of the explanations uh, was given by, to us by uh, the, our respondents is that training is not what it should be. The other explanation is that supervision is not what it should be. Another explanation is about um, uh, uh, lack of resources. Romania is a poor country, one of the poorest country in European Union, of course. And um, there are so many poor communities, so uh, there are no resources. All the system is decentralized. So the poorer communities, the purer counties, don't mobilize sufficient resources for the um, child protection. The other is lack of proper inspection, for example, lack of monitoring the child protection system. So causes are many. And of course, in uh, 10 minutes, I wouldn't be able to explain you everything. Um, what other things can be said in the just some minutes is that, um, sorry, may I continue? Yes, just finish, is that um, for the Romanian child protection system, families are very important. So preserving children, family ties, and allowing children to stay in the family as long as possible. Of course, in a poorly resourced child protection system, there is no interest to take the children away. So evaluating violence um, uh, in this kinds of system is often allowing the children to stay too much in the family, even if risks are high. The other is uh, to make sure that um, uh, residential homes, the big residential homes are uh, closing and the more modern family-based professional um, foster care should be put in place instead of uh, residential care, big institution residential care. So these are two of the most uh, main directions, for example, in, in the changes. Even though uh, these um, efforts are there, um, the child protection, the children in child protection, the children in residential homes, in the family-based residential, family-type residential homes, and even those in foster families, 
uh, responded to us to research that uh, they are often abused, their uh, rights are not respected. So um, in spite of the efforts, uh, the drop in the ranking of the child protection, what I mentioned already, is justified. So in 2019, uh, in 2020, I think uh, it had the rank. It was it ranked uh, um, 129. I think, if I remember well. So there is a, a big drop in this ranking, and there are many problems to be solved. But we can talk other time. I get. I let. Thank you, I'll call it continue. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is uh, George Giglo. I'm. Uh, part of this team, uh, part of the consent project. I'll do my best to be uh, brief so that I allow Daniela and um, Gabriel to speak more about the, um, uh, this case that has been at the core, I would say, of uh, the rationale for our uh, project when we started discussing it. So there are two things uh, which I would like to uh, bring to the table, uh, complementing uh, what Maria has said, uh, based on the research we have conducted as part of this project and based on her experience in working with the system, within the system. Um, so she has uh, given you an impression of what uh, she got out of her experience from within the system, but also uh, some of the things that we have acquired, uh, the ideas we have, we have acquired throughout the project uh, in, when interviewing and working with uh, people who are currently working uh, in the system and um, who have highlighted, have pointed out some of the shortcomings uh, when it comes to how the uh, how child protection principles, let's say, are enforced by uh, child protection services um, um, and the way the principles which are to some extent nicely embedded in the legislation fail to be uh, properly enacted in practice. Uh, so uh, let me add to this what we have noticed when we have tried to bring a more data-oriented perspective on, um, uh, on how the services are structured and how they, they work. And uh, very briefly, uh, I would say that the, the, problem we have, the problems we have noticed when trying to place a, a data image on, on the services are uh, captured quite well many of the challenges that we faced on a number of fields when it comes to public policy in Romania uh, in this attempt to enact data-driven uh, policy. So when it comes to child protection services, um, the topic is uh, suffers, I would say, from being uh, divided among too many agencies. We have, the, as Maria said, uh, the services highly deconcentrated, decentralized. Uh, there, there are the national agencies, the ministries, uh, which uh, handle each of them, the Ministry of Interior, for instance, uh, the Ministry of Labor and uh, Social Protection, which holds most of the um, burden, let's say, when it comes to monitoring child protection, to some extent the Ministry of Health as well, but each of them covers a bit of the uh, image, uh, yet there is no, not even at the central level among these agencies, a proper integration um, of how they communicate, how they uh, structure the information that they acquire, which is visible in the quality of the data that we as researchers can access when trying to um, uh, see what's happening and you know, analyze and come up with uh, solutions and inputs as as we should. But besides the central level, there's also the local level, which uh, depends a lot on the resources of, uh, the, of local administrations. Um, and uh, this has been quite uh, staggering for us uh, when we have tried to um, um, collect data, which is, again, to some extent available on various websites. Uh, when we have noticed that from county to county there is a very large variation. For instance, there are counties where I think for 2020 uh, there were zero cases reported for um, uh, cases of sexual violence that are investigated by authorities. Um, along the same, um, in the same northeastern region of, uh, of Romania, uh, there is one county with seven such cases and another one with, uh, with over 60 such cases that are investigated. So obviously a large variation that points to this uh, uh, problem of poor data and poor uh, uh, integration of data among various levels of um, institutions that uh, uh, deal with it. And uh, secondly, and maybe we return to this uh, a bit later because I think the follow-up uh, to my intervention is also quite relevant. Uh, everything is developed in a context of very low trust in institutions from citizens in institutions and 
uh, very poor cooperation also on a layer of low trust uh, among uh, these institutions. So this lack of dialogue, which is visible in when trying to access data, uh, actually has a more profound, um, uh, more profound causes. So I'll stop here and maybe we'll return to some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to the final presentation and you need to keep it shorter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief in my presentation. Um, uh, so, uh, obviously, given the nature of the project and topic of the project, we had to include a discussion of the Naustal case, also known as the Botnaru case, by name, the name of the family. Um, and uh, we do so because we are very much interested in how a child uh, protection system crisis can uh, have implications on the democratic culture. Um, this is part of a, a projected chapter that uh, four of us are uh, working on, so me, Gabriel, Sorana and Viorella. Um, and which, for which we have this provisional title, values, procedures, and the relativity of the right thing to do, because clearly both values and procedures have became conten contested and contentious issues uh, throughout this case. Uh, I suppose everyone is familiar with the case and with the um, developments um, um, from 2015-2016, so um, I'll just briefly tell you how we are trying to, uh, to address it in, in, in our work. Because as I said, the main relevance for us is that it speaks for a situation where a crisis um, context can in fact be connected to democratic values and ha can have effects on um, uh, the democratic attachment of, of people. Uh, it has been a very uh, particular uh, uh, development also because it has it had a strong media coverage and it also benefited from a unprecedented solidarization and uh, protests uh, uh, from the part of civil society also very many critical reactions from from the institutions and as you know perhaps the narratives have been extremely complex uh, at times confusing perhaps, uh, one element which became uh, terribly uh, um, controversial has been the religious one. Um, and uh, we'll see uh, in Gabriel's intervention that religion actually is, is a factor that um, should not be um, 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 overlooked because it is important. Uh, we try to assess to address this issue both qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, our focus today will be on the quantitative side. We had a survey with data collected both from Norway and from Romania. Data has been collected in the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Romanian respondents have been asked about their knowledge, about their awareness of um, this case. And it has been surprising that five years after uh, its occurrence, 60% uh, of the people actually were able to remember uh, about the case. And um, we asked them to give them, uh, to give us their opinion about the outcome. And uh, uh, what we actually saw was, was that uh, about 90% of them were critical about the outcome, a criticism that has been um, addressed uh, to the Norwegian authorities uh, in the sense that they perceived the um, um, intervention has been exaggerated in, in extent and intensity, but also they were critical about the lack of uh, uh, sufficient response from the Romanian authorities and the lack of uh, enough involvement uh, in terms of solving the situations, uh, situation in um, uh, co-work with uh, with the Norwegian authorities. So a, a very small minority of our respondents, uh, about 9%, believe that the Norwegian authorities acted um, um, in the right manner. Um, hence our uh, idea of the relativity of the right thing to do. But Gabriel will tell you more about um, uh, the actual determinants of uh, this critical attitude and uh, we can start a discussion from there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Gabriel Valdescu from Cluj, Romania. Um, 
So <clears throat> we conducted this survey, uh, being interested what uh, what are uh, the public's attitudes uh, regarding this case, but also children's rights and uh, other aspects. I'd like to add uh, a couple of things about the Romanian context uh, and uh, which uh, inspire us. One is that. Uh, um, we, uh, as, as my colleague said, we pay attention to uh, democratic culture and uh, <clears throat> according to cross-national surveys, Romania is not in a good shape from this point of view and it's also uh, declining. So our concern was that uh, a crisis like this uh, could contribute to, uh, to this kind of uh, decline. So this was something that we wanted to evaluate. Uh, another interesting aspect about Romania is that uh, it, it is the most religious country in Europe, according to cross-national studies. More than 55% of the population uh, considered them to be deeply religious. So uh, a case which uh, was uh, presented uh, to the public from the very beginning as being a fight between uh, uh, a family which is uh, religious and a state which is secular and do not uh, pay attention to uh, the, <clears throat> the wishes of a uh, religious family was something that uh, was expected to, uh, to, uh, to uh, have a strong impression on the Romanian public. And finally, another, another aspect which is important about, uh, interesting about Romania and relevant in our case is the very large uh, diaspora, which is uh, up to 20% of the total population. And in this case, uh, diaspora was uh, mobilized to an unprecedented uh, extent and uh, became uh, part of the uh, activities which took pl a place over eight months and pressured the Norwegian state and authorities to, to change their uh, decisions. Uh, <clears throat> So we, we run some uh, statistical models and try to see uh, which explain the views of the public. And the main fun findings were that, uh, uh, first of all, as Daniela said, we were surprised by how many people remember the case. There are some other studies in the literature where uh, the public is uh, not aware of many events, important events that take place in their societies, and this was not uh, the case. Um, also, uh, the vast majority of those who remember are critical of how the case was dealt with. Um, less than 10% uh, were uh, positive about uh, how Norwegian authorities uh, uh, treated the case, uh, and the rest are split between those who blame Norwegian authorities and uh, the rest who blame uh, both Norwegian and Romanian authorities. Uh, an interesting finding uh, from our point of view is that uh, religiosity is a, a strong uh, predictor of uh, the views, but also um, the, the view of how um, uh, the Romanian society should, uh, should look. And uh, we, we found that people who uh, are open to um, non democratic alternatives of regimes, and especially those who would favor a society uh, led by church uh, religious authorities, uh, tend to be the ones who uh, are the most negative about how the case was uh, treated. Uh, and this is interesting also uh, when we put this in relationship with the lack of any effects from uh, uh, variables such as having children uh, or having uh, diverse views on um, children's rights or uh, minority rights. So apparently uh, the, the crisis was uh, described to the public in, in terms of uh, this tension between uh, uh, traditional society, modern society, religious, non-religious, uh, but it completely wasted uh, the, uh, a serious debate or perhaps even a minor debate regarding uh, children's rights. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That uh, leaves us with a little bit of time for questions. And you will, if there, you, you know the drill now, so you stand over here and you can post your questions through that microphone over there. I will start the discussion, but I really encourage anyone to just uh, stand over there and you will 
be the one that I let in. But uh, let's start with uh, a question to you, Gabriel, and, um, um, and the others can feel free to chime in. Do you believe that the normative character of cosmopolitanism is at root cause or kind of a threat to uh, known identities and affiliations and preferences? So that it, cosmopolitan in and of itself is a threat to that causes democratic backsliding and even constitutional backsliding. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, there is a there is a tension between uh, <clears throat> this uh, this event and uh, uh, the perspective of uh, the citizens on national identity and. Uh, um, and so, um, we we also found that uh, in in our data, which were limited, uh, there are very few expected uh, correlations and links between uh, perspective on society and uh, uh, political aspects and uh, how people perceive these uh, issues regarding children, which uh, suggested to us that uh, these topics are. Uh, are not visible in general, and the society is not uh, debating on, on them. Good. And from a philosophical point of view, Aaron, would you say that these kind of normative order that the cosmopolitanism constitute is 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 it conflicting in any way with with the affiliations of other types of normative orders in Romania that causes this kind of democratic backsliding? Well, uh, you should know that Eastern Europe is, is more or less nationalistic uh, at any time. So, uh, per se, uh, there you could say that. But uh, what, I, what I just understood from Gabriel's uh, report is that basically it is not a nationalistic versus cosmopolitan uh, in, in the sense that I'm talking about cosmopolitanism, so the transnationalistic uh, uh, component respected. It's, it's not a conflict uh, among those, but rather a modern versus uh, non-modern uh, conflict, which would uh, not argue pro or against a modern nation state, but, but rather against uh, secular states from a from a, a religious, non-modern, or not not classically modern uh, perspective. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also Romania is uh, has been very cosmopolitanized, and through through this huge amount of migration and and interaction. So, I um, I don't think the the background of that is a, is a strong nationalistic normativity. There, there hasn't been a phenomena uh, similar to Hungary or, or Poland at uh, that degree, at least. Um, so, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, May I? Yeah, sure. I come, sorry. Uh, I discussed a lot with my students six years ago about uh, how they feel, students in child protection, how they feel about this case and um, what they try to explain me is that uh, they understand from CR, from the children's rights principles that it's not only about um, normativity in sense that violence is bad so you have to take away the children from the families if they, they are endangered in their families but also that you have to respect family and you have to respect the culture so cultural aspects are against uh, this normativity of uh, uh, treating every family the same, even if they are, if they have religious backgrounds or not. So it's about the context, the culture of the, the family, of the community that should be respected. Uh, and that was then. I think now Romania has progressed. Yeah, I put it in quotes. It has changed a lot in the direction of nationalism and in um, against globalization and against uh, cosmopolitanism. So uh, uh, not only Hungary or other countries, but also Romania has advanced in it. So I don't know exactly um, 
what is the proportion, how they would react in such cases, but in similar cases that happened in Germ Germany, that children were taken away from the families because of violence committed in the family. And in Denmark recently, uh, there has been a case, uh, the reaction was even stronger from many um, from many agencies and so and also from the state and uh, ex exactly that the, the children's uh, culture and uh, this has to be respected. Thank you. Uh, speaking to your presentation, George, uh, do you believe the lack of understanding of cosmopolitanism is an inhibitor of human rights enforcement in Romania? And uh, perhaps especially in the context of a low trust country? Um, well, I would say that the problem is that, uh, or the, the, the fundamental problem is that uh, cosmopolitanism, the, the, the basics of cosmopolitanism essentially have to be enforced by elites. And I think the low trust is, uh, this is where it kicks in. It is, uh, as we know, on this basis of very low trust, it's very difficult for citizens, the general public, whatever we want to phrase it, uh, to accept narratives that are enforced by elites, uh, be them intellectual, political, institutional elites uh, of any kind. Uh, therefore, I think some of these uh, principles of cosmopolitanism that we are discussing and analyzing and which, uh, as we said, to some extent are actually embedded into legislation, you find all the keywords uh, there up to a point, are very difficult to be internalized, not only at the level of the general public, but also at the level of the human resources that are populating these um, uh, institutions. So, um, of course, there is much more to unpack when it comes to why this is um, uh, this is happening. But I think, um, as as long or until uh, this discourse is uh, concentrated only in the hands in the voices of a certain kind of elite and there is this backlash against what is coming from uh, elites i think will be in a similar dynamic unless there is some kind of i don't know say maybe political shock that manages to reshape the way institutions function thank you we're going to finish up with uh, the nastal case which is really important uh, in barnavan uh, as an academic field, Daniela and Gabriel. Uh, and Daniela, first of all, uh, you have found in your survey data that uh, uh, there's a widespread perception that Norway uh, enacted, acted quite excessively. And it, you got the courts in Norway agree with that position. <laughs> but um, would you, can you please reflect a little bit about how, how the, what Neustal case actually did or did not do for the uh, for the push, the democratic push for family politics, LGBTQ uh, politics in uh, in Romania. Um, well, uh, I can partially answer to, you, to your question. Um, what I think uh, the case, the crisis situation failed to do is to, uh, and that's something that I guess it's suggested by our data, and it's also uh, an intuition of ours. It failed to uh, uh, offer saliency to the issue of um, a children's rights and um, the protection, uh, so the children's rights and um, priority to to children's rights. I guess I guess it it failed to to raise the saliency of that issue among the general public, um, because I I think that. Um, uh, what took precedence over that was the idea that um, uh, the, the family, as a, as, a, as a whole entity, has not been protected, and the right to the family has not been protected. That's, that's why we are we are trying now. Our survey is not complex enough as to to uh, uh, because the the questions were not not there to inspect in depth uh, the, their attitudes. But judging by how. Um, uh, the media covered the event and the critical reactions have looked like uh, there was clear mix of uh, contesting the procedures which have been accused of a uh, lack of transparency and all sorts of shortcomings that uh, uh, vitiated the entire uh, process but also uh, was uh, put in terms of value so 
there was this mixed discourse procedure, so exactly the, the very formal um, elements, but also the principles, the values that um, that should take priority. And I think that this is, speaks a bit for how Norway and Romania, maybe I'm wrong, but my colleagues can correct me, how Norway and Romania are, are different in terms of child protection, both in uh, how it's institutionally enforced, but how uh, the population feels and thinks about it. Um, child, child's rights in Norway prevail um, as a matter of principle. Um, and I, I think they're not as um, a salient, um, this, this discourse is not as salient in, in Romania. So from my point of view, I think the case sort of failed to to raise the saliency of that because it kind of uh, directed the discussion elsewhere and uh, um, the, uh, um, the there was perhaps not, not 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 enough communication or not enough understanding or not enough uh, uh, combination between a critical reaction to to the uh, to the intervention uh, empathy for the family which was clearly in a, in a difficult situation and um, um, I, I'll, I'll, you want to to add something uh, to this? This this is how we I, need to go in for a, a yeah. landing real quick and real okay. quick, Gabriel, because the last one for you we are across the time limit. And I'm like, I see you. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, the Nansal case, kind of, you have uh, shown in your empirical uh, data that it has uh, dec you have declined in democratic support, and then it becomes really important. That, what can we do about this? I think, I think that, yeah, I think the problem with this case was that uh, it became part of the cultural clash that we see in many countries and uh, uh, very strongly in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, it was uh, linked very quickly with other issues such as uh, LGBT rights. Uh, Romania had uh, uh, a referendum for family, it was called like this, with an attempt of changing the constitution to block uh, homosexual marriages. And um, there were the same activists which uh, were part of this uh, case, including the, the family uh, itself, Bodnari family, um, was active for a couple of months to, to increase uh, salience of this referendum, uh, which failed. And later, um, those who were activists in ref referendum uh, established a new party, which could be labeled as a far-right party. So we see a, a lot of links between these uh, events. Uh, what could be done is to try to avoid this this trap of uh, of a discourse with uh, which is uh, uh, has this kind of polarization. We we see the example of the United States is not easy. They fail with a lot of policies because they split the society in the in those uh, two halves. Uh, so uh, it, it it should be linked to communication, as Daniela said. Uh, one side should show more empathy to the family, the future family in a, in the future crisis. Uh, but also, um, uh, we should learn from from the side which uh, uh, won the the debate. Uh, they uh, enlisted uh, experts from Norway, uh, uh, which were. Uh, favorable, uh, which were against the authorities in, in Norway. So they, they presented very, very well, uh, very professional one side of the story. So the, the story should be presented from two sides, but in a way which is not polarized as it was the case in, in the past. Thank you very much. That's all for us. The left, the left of the discussion has to be tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs> <Warren the night. laughs>